Okay, so for our topic H, here, um, for those of you who recall all the stuff we've been covering so far, going all the way back to topic A, we began discussing the impact of micro, and a portion of this had to do with, you know, kind of what came before us in those contributions, just like we talked about penicillin and Fleming, but things like Pasteur and Joe Lister and so on and so forth. Now, the idea here is that barely, just barely 100 years into these kind of um, discoveries and contributions, we're kind of starting to get an idea of how important this concept of bacterial control or microbial control is. So here, we're going to kind of introduce just kind of the basics on what does it mean, how does it work, and so on and so forth. But then we're going to show you the examples on how we can actually control microbial growth. And then towards the end, we'll show you some examples, we'll give you some uh, new ideas, the current uh, challenges that exist, and very almost to the last point when we talk about antimicrobial resistance, these uh, drug resistant organisms. And then the last topic you'll notice that I have highlighted, that's really where we're gonna deal with your paper, your research paper on diseases, that's really where that one's gonna focus. So keep that in mind. So, first portion. Um, it's always, it's kind of Im important to kind of remember the common misconceptions. Um, one of the biggest ones on this planet is the concept of the word sterile, in which uh, we're going to talk about a substance or an agent that sterilizes something. It's called a sterilant, okay? And it's this, uh, defined as any agent that pretty much removes or destroys all life. So 100%, okay? So that includes anything that's resistant, anything that we think is strong. It doesn't matter. It's 100% destruction of anything that is alive. The problem with that is to truly kind of sterilize anything. It's kind of difficult. Not only does it require uh, an immense amount of energy and heat, but it's often probably too expensive to make it practical. And the other issue is that if we wanted to sterilize something, remember that it's removing all life, you can't quite sterilize a human. It's not possible without setting them on fire and disintegrating them. So the actual concept of sterilization is virtually kind of impossible to achieve. So we kind of redefine it in more or less practical terms. For example, there's something called commercial sterilization, which is aimed at removing anything that might be bad for you. It's not all life. It's just sterilizing things that could be pathogenic as opposed to, for example, laboratory sterilization, in which we truly mean kill everything. That's what we do or we did in the lab beforehand. So, and keeping in mind that this only applies to things that are inanimate. So this, these are abiotic factors. So things that have never been alive, never will be. You can't quite, again, sterilize a dog or sterilize a human without killing them as well. So really what the term what most people are looking for is something called a sepsis. So the idea of asepsizing or antisepsizing is the other term you'll hear, um, a living uh, organism. And so the idea here, again, is to remove only the bad things, not 100%, just the bad guys. So really, we're going to look at two big terms, and this is what are going to be our labs a little bit later on, is the idea of disinfecting or the concept of disinfection and which will use either chemical or physical or both uh, types of methods to remove specifically things that might be bad for us. So again, not 100% organisms, just the things that we might be concerned about. Um, and so we call that a disinfectant. So these are the classic stuff you have at home. And again, we will do this in the lab, show you how we use disinfectants, as opposed to antiseptics. So antisepsizing something or the use of substances on living surfaces, you, your pets, so on and so forth, to again, remove any type of pathogenic or uh, harmful uh, organisms onto you. So another term that gets thrown out a lot out there is the concept of de-germing something. And so this is the combination of using physical and chemical methods to remove all microorganisms, good or bad. So this is a little bit closer to the concept of sterility as opposed to just disinfecting or antisepsizing something. Another good term to remember is the difference on how we control things based on the suffix 
stasis versus side. And here what we're talking about specifically is we, have, we can have substances that are static versus sidal, meaning things that kind of stop the growth versus things that kill the growth. In other words, for example, uh, something can be bacteriostatic, in meaning that the bacteria will stop growing, they're not dead, they just don't divide any further, versus something that is bactericidal, which means that that organism ceases to exist. So we'll start expanding upon these as we go. Now, that being said, um, most of the time we're interested in killing things. We're interested in removing all sorts of pathogens, all sorts of possibilities of things coming back and trying to kill you. Now, yes, there's plenty of substances that are static out there, but that's probably not going to be in most of our focus, just so you know. Now, the idea here is that we want to stop them from growing, stop them from dividing, and more than anything else, we want to stop them from living. So here we're going back to the previous topic in topic G in dealing with metabolism. If you can inhibit them, its metabolism, you will stop its growth. That's the general gist. And so how do we kind of measure this? I'm going to throw a couple of other terms a little bit later, is this idea of death rate. It's pretty much the mathematical way of establishing how fast or how efficient we're uh, removing something, killing something, or stopping something. And it'll depend. Sometimes we measure it per minute. Sometimes we measure it per 10 minutes. Um, but the idea is to measure it at a constant rate. So we'll look at that a little bit later. Now, just to quickly summarize, your textbook does a really good job of kind of giving you all the terms in a neat little table. So if you're kind of looking to expand upon that, just use the table that we have here from your textbook, and that gives you most of those definitions. Okay, so, so far so good. Anybody? Okay, so going from the table, now let's kind of look at the approaches on how we want to design our drugs. And so there's two big ways to kind of look at this. One from the external concept and the other one from the internal concept. So let me kind of show this to you a little bit more easily. For example, when we're taking a look at bacteria, remember that one of the ways we can approach controlling our organism is by its envelope and its wall. In other words, can we destroy its barrier? Can we destroy its system of protection? So gram-positive organisms only having that one membrane in that thick layer of peptidoglycan is a little bit different than dealing with a gram-negative organism, which has two layers of membranes and a thinner layer of PG. And then the other aspect is that internal concept in which, for example, if we can address how its ribosomes work, um, if we can address how it's replicating or transcribing, we can also limit, if not kill, uh, the growth of that organism. So there's going to be two approaches on how we try and design these drugs. So first of all, let's try and see if I can give you an overall perspective of how we design chemotherapy, this kind of ideal concept of a drug. And then we'll show you what the limitations are. Now at the top of my list, not that it's actually a factor to consider, but ideally that's part of the list, is that we would like to create drugs that are cheap, right? Um, not that that's usually the case, but ideally that's something we would want. And I'll explain to you why that becomes a, a challenge, but again, I like to bring it up as a factor. Now, we want our drugs to be quick. Obviously, we want them to be able to work as fast as possible. We want them to also be able to last long, and that means in terms of its stability within the human, within the patient, but as well as outside the human. So your pill should be able to last long sitting on the shelf. The other piece behind this is we want it to be all powerful. This idea that um, we want our drug to work as efficiently as best as possible. And more than anything else, we would like that drug to be asymptomatic. We really don't want it to have any side effects. Something that pretty much most of you are familiar with, especially when you listen to any commercial listing any drug and their side effects, right? So that's what we want. Aside from the kind of making a cheap one, everything else is part of how we do drug design. Now, the problem is with this is that most of the time, this is almost, again, impossible to achieve. So there's lots of considerations. And so some of the factors you should consider for this, let me give you an example, is location. And this has two aspects to it. Physical location, both in terms of where the patient is and where on the patient we want to treat it. 
Let me give you a simple example. If we were to deal with something like a cream, let's just make that up as we go along. If you have some sort of topical lotion that you need to apply for a rash, let's just make that up, right? There's a very big difference between how that cream will work if you live, for example, in the United States versus where if you live in, I don't know, Belize or South America or something like that. Why? Um, tropical environments are very different than dry environments, as I'm sure you understand. For example, sweating. So the amount of sweat prevents the use of certain topical substances. Heat, as it is, it's hotter towards the middle of the equator as opposed to where it is a little bit more up north. So that plays a role. Believe it or not, in terms of where you apply it on the patient, makes a big deal where it's on its skin, whether it's on your forehead or on your foot, also plays a role. Believe it or not, the color of your skin, pigmentation plays a role. Pigments within our epidermal layers also prevent the passage of certain uh, drugs uh, a little bit more efficiently. So these are things to take into account. So when we're designing a drug, for example, we need to take this into account. Most of the time we're you know, playing on bunnies and on rats, but we don't really know how well it will work on all humans. Every human is different. So this is why we undergo chemical trials sorry, clinical trials. Um, and the idea here is to ensure that it will be as totipotent as we want it to be. Now, the other concept behind this is we also need to take into account the organism itself and you as a patient, how susceptible you are to that drug. Not only the organism, how well it will deal with that drug, but also how you will be able to handle it. That plays that role in terms of being asymptomatic, but how well you can process that. How well does your liver work? How well does your kidneys uh, work themselves? So those are factors to consider too. And then probably the most obvious of this story are the environmental factors. So anything from temperature to pH, things that we've been already looking along for the last couple of months on the effect behind drugs, as well as proteins and our enzymes. So for that kind of, let me give you a little bit of a perspective behind this. And so I kind of drawn a simple little arrow indicating how these drugs kind of increase in their uh, properties. And so on the lower left hand side, we have what we consider low level germicides. What does that mean is that these are the weakest, the, at least at that point in time, working sets of chemotherapy. So low level germicides include anything that can kill our regular gram positive bacteria. This includes uh, some uh, envelope viruses and even some of the naked viruses that are out there. But it won't kill things like shrooms, for example. Um, and so for shrooms, if you're gram negatives and things like that, we have what we call an intermediate level germicide. And then remember that there's protective uh, structures like endospores and spores and cysts and things like that that are relatively strong against these harsh environments. So for those, we require high level germicides. Now again, these lines, as pretty as I'm drawing them out there, they're not quite so set. They kind of blur in between. But the idea is there are scales on how these drugs exist. Now, here's where the discussion kind of builds up a little bit, is that knowing that we have these high-level germicides, why is it that we don't uh, administer those to everybody else? In other words, why don't we go with the best treatment immediately? And this will address something that most of you will be able, be able to kind of comment upon. And the idea here is I assume that most of you have had an experience, if not multiple experiences, going to your primary, primary uh, healthcare provider in which you went in, you asked for a type of treatment based on your ailment, and you got something, went home, and it didn't work. You had to schedule another appointment, let them know, hey, look, I tried this, it didn't work for me, I need something better and a little bit stronger. They give you something else also, go home again, try it, still didn't work, so on and so forth, and you go into this back and forth experience with your healthcare provider. And at the end, you get something that works. And so usually the question is, well, why didn't we start there in the first place? Why didn't you give me the best drug available right off the bat? And so as uh, primary healthcare providers, we are actually trained to administer the lowest levels first always. This is part of protocol. This is part of training. This is part of what we go through medical school training and teaching our medical students. This is what you start with. The reason behind this is, as 
silly as that idea may sound like, is that as we progress through low level, intermediate level, and high level germicides, as we get stronger and stronger, we also increase the amount of side effects. We increase the amount of symptoms uh, that they can produce and also the toxicity associated with them, as well as the uh, price goes up significantly higher. So we are trained to first give you the cheapest, the softest version of the drug, as opposed to the most powerful. Now, as counterproductive as that may sound, there's two reasons behind that. One has to do with, we don't wanna get sued, right? This idea is that if we give you the highest level drug when something uh, a little bit easier, a little bit softer, a little bit cheaper could have worked beforehand, we made a better choice. But second, for that same kind of relationship, is that we progressively give you stronger and stronger things to prevent the buildup of resistances, specifically from the side of the uh, microbe. In other words, if we can kill your organism with a low level germicide as opposed to a high level germicide, we're saving pretty much that organism from evolving and killing you later. Understand just like your 99.9% .9 um, antimicrobial substance, if we hit it hard, usually what remains is probably the most resistant, the strongest of the organisms out there. And if you now hit it with the most powerful drug that you have, and that didn't kill it, we now ran out of options. We no longer have a drug that will work on you. Instead, we kind of start low, we hit it, little by little in the hopes that a combination of drugs in your own immune system will work against it as opposed to hitting it hard and now running completely out of options. Second, again, back to this idea is if we give you the strongest, most powerful dose that we have out there too, it's quite possible that one, we could have given you something less. The more thing else is the symptoms associated with it. You might experience far stronger uh, side effects than you needed to undergo in the first place. And so, there's a little bit of a catch-22 here of where should we start. By training, we need to start with the lowest level, as counterproductive as that may sound. Now, before I kind of move on to a little bit further behind that, I want to make sure that everybody's on board behind this. Okay, so based on this idea of this susceptibility scale, again, understanding why we start from the lowest scale to the highest scale has its uh, methods to its madness too, but this also includes those tests that we're going to be training you on, like labs 19 through 38, in which those diagnostic tests help us hone in on which type of organism might be infecting you, or multiple ones too, to help us administer the best treatment possible. So what we're going to do now is kind of cover some of the basic methods associated with uh, chemotherapy or physiotherapy associated with dealing or controlling microbial growth, right? So probably at the top of the list of a physical method is temperature, probably the most basic one of them all. Uh, with that, we also include things like desiccation, meaning the drying of things, if you will, uh, passing things through uh, surfaces like filtration, um, and then pressure and so on and so forth. We probably won't get through the entire list, but we'll try and get as many as we can. Now, Probably as easy as you all already know for the last couple of topics, heat, more than anything else, molecular motion, the faster things move, the more it can disrupt things. So that means anything from destroying enzymes to separating pieces of DNA, like um, the concept of melting, or just like anything else, the hotter things get, the more uh, fluid do oils become. So that means it's disrupting things like membranes and envelopes and so on and so forth. So heat plays a major role. Um, and so as we measure the eff efficacy of heat, uh, we have two bits of terminology that I want you to know in the calculation associated with it called decimal reduction time, meaning how well does something work by reducing 90% of its concentration, meaning it kills off 90% of that pathogen, if you will. So that's a decimal reduction time. And so what we're looking here is one, what's the lowest temperature we can use to do so? And that's usually measured in 10 minute increments. Or if you have a constant temperature, how long would it take for you to eliminate all of that? So those are the two ones we're gonna deal with. So let me give you one of the examples, the most common one of them all is what we call moist heat. Go with the words, people go with the words. Uh, the reason why we're kind of envisioning this concept of moist versus dry 
is because we're going to use water or some sort of liquid. Liquids are usually really good at transferring heat. So water comes our, uh, becomes our best bet here. And probably the most common example here is boiling stuff. And I assume that most of you are familiar with this concept, aside from cooking, but probably the best example I can give you is especially if you're a parent. So for those of you who've been parents, uh, you know that, for example, you can almost disinfect most uh, abiotic surfaces or most inanimate objects by boiling things for about 10 to maybe 15 minutes or so at boiling temperature or 100 degrees Celsius. All right, this will kill most bacteria, if not all that we're concerned about, uh, most shrooms, uh, most protists too, and even a few of the viruses out there. Okay, now um, this is a very important point that you're bringing over here, Sarah, is that um, we boil things as a way to sterilize stuff. Obviously, you can't use this on animate objects or um, biotic factors. You obviously kill them. But here's an important concept, especially if, especially if you're a parent. When you're becoming your first parent, the first thing you're being told is that you need to kind of sterilize everything, you need to disinfect everything, right? And so most parents, first time parents, kind of freak out about this and they virtually sterilize their entire home. They uh, kind of disinfect everything. They boil the crap out of everything. And then as they become a second parent, they kind of loosen up a little bit. And then by the time you're like a third time parent or fourth time parent, if the pacifier hits the ground, you're like, ah, whatever, blow on it and just shove it back into the baby or something like that. But ideally, you kind of start off with kind of killing everything. And boiling water is a really good one to do so. Now, unfortunately, um, it doesn't work well against resistant structures. So your endospores, spores, cysts, and even uh, a little bit more of a few versions of envelope virus, so non-envelope viruses, it doesn't work very well. The amount of time that would be required to do so kind of goes up, up to about 20 hours to do so. And that becomes a little bit uh, unfeasible for most things. But for everyday life, 10, 15 minutes boiling water works relatively well. So anything from uh, your forks and knives to glassware and things like that, boil it pretty decently clean, if you will. Now, in our lab, for example, if we really want to sterilize everything we're using, especially things like glassware, okay, um, we have something called an autoclave in which we still use this moist heat, except that we do it under pressure. We now, um, since anything above 100 degrees Celsius turns into steam, you know, if you're boiling it off, if we increase the amount of pressure over it to about 15 pounds per square inch or 15 PSI, we can actually keep it um, in water format as opposed to steam or liquid format, I should say. And that will virtually sterilize most things too. Now, the idea behind this is that we need a high pressure environment. And so what you're seeing on the right hand side is a baby version of it. It's roughly the size of a large microwave. And it's kind of like a little mini submarine in which it goes up to about 121 degrees Celsius under a high amount of pressure. And within anywhere between an hour or so, virtually everything in there has been destroyed. That will create virtually a sterile environment. This is what we do with most lab equipment, including any clinical equipment that you have in any uh, clinical setting. Now, what's really cool about this too, is that again, it works really well, again, as long as you keep it under those conditions. The problem is, is that something the size of a microwave can't really sterilize everything we need. So we need larger ones. So for us, for example, in our lab, the one that is next to us is the size of an entire room. You can actually technically fit in there. So uh, for us to do batch type autoclaving, we can throw in large amounts of glassware, lots of amounts of liquids in there to kind of keep them under pressure, sterilize them, and that's what we use in everyday labs or clinical settings. Now, how do we know it works though? Well, we actually have a really cool system, what we normally call um, autoclave tape, which is what you're seeing in the lower right-hand side corner. It's this tape that will change color once it reaches that 121 degrees Celsius after about one hour of doing so. Now, how do we design that? The curious thing about that is that we had to use a bacterium to do so. There's this organism called Bacillus thermophilus, which is a thermophile. Remember that thermophiles are these organisms that resist heat, right? And so this one, when uh, sent to the correct heat, will actually change 
uh, produce pigments and change color. So the irony of this all is even though we are looking to sterilize or clean off our instrumentation, our labware, our glassware and stuff like that, we are still maintaining one little organism alive to actually do so. Now, thankfully, Bacillus thermophilus is completely innocuous to us. It doesn't harm us in any way, shape or form. Now, if this is not part of your uh, limitations, uh, we can't uh, use this. Uh, the next best thing is by using that little bit of history that we gave you um, three months back is the concept of pasteurization uh, in which we will use a little bit less temperature, about 63 degrees Celsius for about half an hour, and that will mostly get rid of all the bad stuff. Now, it's again, non-sterilizing, all right, but it'll still remove most of those pathogenic things that we need to be concerned about. However, 63 degrees Celsius is still not enough to kill anything that is a thermophile, for example those guys that love the heat. Now, mind you, for everything else we might be concerned, pretty good stuff. Now, if you scale it up just a few more degrees up beyond that, so about 72 degrees Celsius, we can actually change the time to about 15 seconds and virtually, again, achieve a level of disinfection that is needed for most things. This is the type of stuff that occurs, for example, um, for your orange juice, your milk, your canned goods at the store, that's usually what they do. Now, you can have a better version of this if you increase the temperature to about 134 degrees Celsius, and you can achieve something we call flash uh, versions of this or really, really quick, but these are referred to as ultra high pasteurization. And if you just raise it just a tiny little bit more, um, within a couple of seconds, you can actually achieve sterilization. Now, unfortunately for those two last ones, it's extremely expensive. Um, and kind of out of our range for most things. So the stuff that occurs in your everyday life, your stores, uh, the historical or batch pasteurization or the flash pasteurization are the easiest ones to achieve. Now, let me kind of... Uh, um, so back to this kind of concept of pasteurization, I'll ask you one first question and I actually will address your question too. Uh, anybody wanna remind me what's the average temperature of happy life for humans and everything else, anyone? Sydney just kind of wrote it up there, 37 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Angel. Um, your 98.6 degrees is, you know, the happy temperature of most organisms that are trying to kill you too. So from 37 degrees to 63 degrees, that's almost doubling the uh, temperature range for these guys. So virtually anything at 72 and above will end up killing it. Now, in terms of the risk that you're asking, especially since we're talking about things like dairy, um, the risk is actually quite significant. And this is something that we address as uh, clinicians, as scientists, more than anything else, drinking things like unpasteurized milk or unpasteurized dairy, or even things like orange juice that are coming fresh from the farm, if you will, actually pose a significant risk. And it's not necessarily that the organisms in and of themselves might be bad, is the fact that your system, your elementary canal, more than anything else, your guts, if you will, um, are not used to those organisms. And so if something's coming from 200 miles away and you've never been exposed to that particular um, enterobacteria, for example, when you consume it, it will wreak havoc. So it's not necessarily designed to be pathogenic against you, but because your immune system has never encountered it, usually it poses a decent risk um, in terms of your uh, gastrointestinal system itself. So my recommendation as a scientist, as a professional more than anything else, don't consume anything that is unpasteurized. It's not worth the risk. Um, for us, for example, since we're relatively close, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, what is this called? Um, Apple Valley and um, up the hill, what, 30 minutes away from us um, in terms of consuming something like unpasteurized apple cider which as delicious as it may be, that poses a risk and a threat to us. The bacteria present in this, since it hasn't been heated up, since it's just been pressed, freshly pressed, that possesses certain organisms that your system is not used to. So consuming it can easily lead to some GI distress within even 30 minutes. So uh, to kind of answer your question, Ken, the idea here is I would never recommend to consume something else like that unless you are already used to it.
This kind of also brings up the same concept of travel. Although you may consider yourself to have a strong immune system, which we'll address much later, is that anytime you travel to a different country, to a different state even, the uh, local microbiome, in this case, the uh, environmental organisms that are present there are not the same from where you live. So you consuming these does pose a little bit of a risk. So um, your question over here, Sarah, behind that is it's not any different, but the idea is that you consuming it off the tree that you, you know, there's in the back of your house is different than you going to an orchard and consuming it there 30 minutes away. There is a difference in environment, pressure, heat, all of these play a risk. Now, if you're talking about an apple that you're buying from Stater Brothers, for example, that's a big difference. As we're gonna talk about in a little bit, those have been cleaned. Those have been uh, irradiated with UV light, for example. So those have a reduced risk of uh, harming you gastrointestinally. So exactly, so this idea of, you know, when you travel, drink bottled water, as opposed to uh, from the tap, same concept. You don't really know what's present locally in terms of the environment. Not that I'm trying to scare you away in any shape, but just be aware that, you know, you might present a little bit of a GI distress behind that. Um, shots for which I assume, Sid, if you're asking, uh, things like cholera, we don't have a vaccine for it. So um, drinking the water puts you at a big uh, you guys have risk. the extra vessels? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you again? I'll take a... Kind of missed that. Okay. That being cleared up, uh, as opposed to dealing with what we call this moist eater soap, uh, there is a version that does not involve water, just transmission of heat through air, dry heat. And probably the most basic concept behind there is our ovens. So if water is not possible, for example, for whatever reason you're trying to grow something, there's a limitation behind the use of water, uh, you use air. The only issue behind ovens in this case is that now you have a much less efficient uh, way of trying to disinfect or even sterilize things. And the example that I'm giving you here is by using a standard oven, what normally would have taken like 15 minutes using a system of boiling now increases to up to about 60 times worse if you just use air. So not as efficient as we would want it in an autoclave or just boiling water. So yes, it works, just much slower. And if you're cool like us uh, in the lab, we can literally just set something on fire. So the same way that we did it in our lab by using our Bunsen burners, by changing the temperature from just a couple hundred degrees to 700, 1000 degrees or so, by using our double cone system, we can actually virtually disintegrate everything that is present. So fire will always kind of be one of the best choices. Now we can go the other way around behind this and utilize something like slowing them down. So this is something that is static, not sidle. Refrigerating things, slowing down their metabolism can slow the amount of growth without truly kind of stopping it. And if you wanna go a little bit further, you can always freeze them, further slowing it down, but there is a uh, limitation. When you freeze things, water, as you all are familiar with it, when it turns into ice, it expands, it forms crystals. And the problem with these crystals is that they're sharp and they destroy cells. So as opposed to refrigerating something and then using it for later use, when you freeze something, you actually destroy cells. Destroying the cells then prevents them from kind of bringing them back. So this is why we cannot freeze humans as opposed to our sci-fi stories that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Now, if you really wanna go into a better system of this, there is a method to kind of cool things down and then ultimately rehydrate them or bring them back to life. And so this is a process of lyophilization. We can dry things by a process of desiccation and which is just the removal of water. This is something we've been doing for pretty much five to 10,000 years, but it's not uh, as decent because it doesn't remove, for example, uh, fungi. But if you really wanna go that route, you can freeze something and dry it at the same time under uh, vacuuming conditions and that will remove all the water it will prevent ice crystal formation. And hypothetically speaking, you can actually reconstitute it. You can bring it back to life. Now this works for individual cells. It doesn't work for humans. You can't lyophilize a human and bring a human back to life. This only works for individual cells. This is as a matter of fact, how we preserve 
our own uh, E. coli, our own salmonella, that kind of thing. We lyophilize them, we remove the water, we freeze them at the same time, and then we can uh, bring them back to life a little bit later. All right, the last little piece I'm gonna deal with so I can uh, proceed to the next topic is the ability to use a surface that kind of limits the passing of microorganisms by trapping them, by preventing their passage. So this is the idea of filtering something, right? So the idea of passing th something through a filter, through a sieve, if you will, and only allowing certain particles to pass through, like liquids. So we can use any type of uh, surface, porous surfaces, for example, uh, things like glass, porcelain. We can use things like sand, charcoal, as a way to pass fluids through them. And because of that porous surface, larger things get trapped and not pass through. Now, sometimes uh, this uses uh, the help of vacuums to kind of help pass the uh, liquid through it. And probably to report, and this is kind of where we want to conclude this, that we have the best substance that we know out there, with one small exception, is a substance known as nitrocellulose, which happens to have a pore surface, a hole that is anywhere between 25 microns, remember that bacteria are roughly around 10 microns or so, to about 10 nanometers. So now most viruses don't even make it to that size. So these uh, substances are really, really uh, good at filtering things out. Now with that, I bring you to the last piece to talk about how we do this in our field. So if you work in a hospital, in a clinic, uh, some sort of uh, sterile environment, probably most of you have heard of something called a HEPA filter. A HEPA filter, which stands for high efficiency particular air, utilizes these type of filtration devices, this type of nitrocellulose or better substances as a way to filter things out. Now, the only problem with this is that these substances are fairly expensive. And so the more filtering capability it has, you'll notice that on that table, we can go from anything from pore sizes of about five microns, which limit most organisms. Um, but as you get smaller and smaller, you can start removing bacteria, you can start removing protists, um, and even the largest and even some of the smallest versions of these, as you get better and better with the filtering system, you can remove even the smallest viruses. The problem with that is that it gets insanely expensive. So we have one of these in our lab on the right-hand side of our room. That's one of the ones we use. And this is what pretty much is used in most clinical um, and industrial settings. The problem again is the limitation is that it's relatively expensive. So now we'll continue with this a little bit more uh, on Wednesday for the rest of this topic. So I'll pause it right here.